Welcome to the fifth workshop in the 2022 New York State World Languages Professional Learning Series. My name is Candace Black and I am your World Language Associate in the Office of Bilingual Education and World Languages of the New York State Education Department. Today's workshop is entitled Preparing for Standards-Based Curriculum Planning. Vertical and horizontal curriculum alignment is critical to helping learners make continuous growth in proficiency. Intentional sequencing of rich thematic units creates learning experiences that are relevant to learners' interests and appropriate to checkpoint proficiency targets. Vertical articulation spirals proficiency development and recycles and reinforces high-frequency vocabulary and grammatical structures. In this session, participants will examine templates to help analyze and sequence thematic units across the checkpoints. Presenters will also demonstrate tools that can be used to assess how well the curriculum addresses the revised New York State Learning Standards for World Languages, their embedded language functions, and the New York State World Language themes and topics. Let's review a few housekeeping detail. We have more than 780 pre-registered attendees today, so we ask that you remain muted and that you reserve the use of the chat for questions for the presenters or for when the presenters specifically instruct you to use this feature. If you accidentally get disconnected, just reconnect or call me and I will assist you. My cell phone is on the confirmation email I sent you this week. Bill has already very nicely put into the chat the link to the handouts folder. This folder contains all of the revised standards documents, the themes and topics, performance indicators, crosswalks, and unit planning templates and, and exemplars. The PDF of the presentation will be added to this folder at the end of the workshop. Within 24 events or hours of this event, those who attend the workshop in full will receive either a certificate of attendance or a certificate documenting CTLE credit. The type of certificate you will be receiving was indicated in the confirmation email you received after you registered. This workshop is being recorded. The video will be uploaded to the World Languages Professional Learning website within about a week of this event. Those who are unable to attend this live webinar will be able to earn CTLE credit by viewing the video and answering seven out of 10 questions on a post-assessment correctly. Our presenters today are Dr. Lori Langer de Ramirez, Dr. Joanne O'Toole, and Bill Heller. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to invite Lori, Joanne, and Bill to begin this workshop. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final um, webinar of the 2021-2022 Professional Learning Series. Again, today's session is on understanding standards-based curriculum planning. So we have these symbols, the first one being, please keep your microphone muted at least until the end of the session when we invite you perhaps to unmute to ask a question. You'll see this blue thought bubble at places where we're inviting you simply to think alone. This is not to say anything aloud. This is not to put anything into the chat. It's just an opportunity for you to ponder a question that we'll pose. At the end of this session, we will invite you to enter into the chat the questions you have, and we'll do our best to answer all of them. We do ask that you do not use the chat during the session so that others can stay focused on our presentation. And finally, throughout today's session, you'll see this little folder icon. And that means that what we're showing on the screen will be in the Google folder that has been linked in the chat. And again, Bill will continue to enter that link throughout the session at the end of the session. And Candy will send it to you after the session in the follow up email. So I want to invite you, if you're not already incredibly familiar with this, to the professional learning page of the NYSED OBEWL webpage. You'll see this same link um, multiple times in our session today, but these accordion um, bars contain gold. The first one is where you will find any upcoming webinars, workshops, those will resume in the fall with a whole nother series. 
And how you'll know what that series, or at least inform what that series will be about, is by answering the needs assessment survey that you'll be receiving in an email in the very near future. We're looking for your input to inform the next steps that we take. And then there are summer face-to-face -face collaborative unit planning sessions being held all over the state. And so if you haven't yet signed up and are interested, a particular focus on checkpoint A, you can still register. That registration is open. And finally, you'll find the recordings of the 18 workshops that have already been completed, video recorded, and uploaded with resources and quizzes at this third of the blue bars on the professional learning web page. So those 18 workshops have all prepared you for today's session, the two workshops on authentic resources, five on the communication and culture standards, two on proficiency and performance and performance indicators and can-do statements, five on themes and topics and unit planning, one on vocabulary, two on grammar, one on lesson planning. And today is where we're putting it all together as we talk about curriculum planning. So if as we go through today's session, you sense that you have some gaps, perhaps because you didn't have the opportunity yet to view one or more of these webinars, we really invite you to go back, especially over the summer, as perhaps you have a little bit more time to engage with these. Or maybe it was so long ago that a refresher would be in order. But all of these come together in today's session where we're putting it all together. So we have multiple goals for today's session, starting with I can identify the three levels of curriculum development. I can identify what guides development of a world language curriculum. I can identify strategies for developing consensus around curricular goals. I can identify steps for developing a world language curriculum. And I can identify steps for examining a world language curriculum for its horizontal and vertical alignment. So let's get started by looking at curriculum development on three levels. That first level is the state level. Our state education department's Office of Bilingual Education and World Languages, in collaboration with teachers and leaders all over the state, developed our 2021 World Language Learning Standards and guidance to correspond with it, particularly the proficiency ranges and performance indicators and the themes and topics. The next level is district level curriculum. This is what you are engaging with others in your school district to develop. It's a systematic scope and sequence of units of instruction that articulates how the New York State World Language Learning Standards will be enacted locally. And it identifies learning outcomes, not only by proficiency checkpoint, but also by course. And finally, what you do every day, your job as a world language educator is to design those daily lesson plans. The sequential lessons are planning of instruction learning experiences and assessment that are what enact both the New York State World Language Learning Standards and the district level curriculum. So we're going to first take a look at the New York State Learning Standards for World Languages. And what you'll see on the screen here are the actual standards. And there are two sets of standards. One set is for modern languages. And the flip side or the second page of the PDF are the standards for classical languages. These are in the folder and they're also at the link at the bottom of this page, the standards and guidelines 
web page of the OBEWL portion of the state ed website. So let's take a closer look. We have since 1996 been working with the LOAT standards. And in 2021, were adopted the New York State World Language Standards that will begin their implementation in 2023. And what you see on the screen is the front page of a three-part crosswalk that answers these three questions. First, what are the 2021 standards? You will see them side by side with the 1996 standards. It also answers the question, how are the 2021 standards the same as the 1996 LOAT standards? And finally, how are they different? So it's not that everything is different. It's that some things are the same and some things have some shifts. So we're gonna take a closer look at some of those shifts. So in brief, we're moving from having two standards communication and culture, where there was a distinction between communication and culture, to five standards where there is an integration of communication and culture. And so you can see in a nutshell those five standards, interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational communication, integrated with the relating cultural practices and products to perspectives and cultural comparisons standard. And the image that I've put on the sides of these um, slides are intended to really reinforce that idea of integration. These standards are not intended to be separate from one another, but fully integrated one with the other. And in brief, we're moving from four language skills that could be taught discreetly. I remember when I student taught many years ago, my cooperating teacher said to me, make sure every day you do something with speaking, something with listening, something with reading, something with writing. And I did, but they were never necessarily connected. Now we're moving to three modes of communication, which are carried out through language skills. And so we can see that for inter interpretive communication, our students may be reading, listening, viewing, or receiving. In interpersonal communication, they may be speaking, but of course their partner is listening, or they may be signing, or their partner is receiving, or they may be writing, such as a text. And in presentational communication with that one-way message, they may be speaking or signing or writing. And of course, the culture standards are done via any mode of communication. So any skill embedded in any mode. And in brief, we're moving from four language functions Remember, socializing, giving and obtaining information, expressing personal feelings, and getting others to adopt a course of action. And those four functions were specific to a single communication standard. We're now moving to 16 language functions, with one or more assigned to each of the five standards. And again, we see our five standards illustrated and we can see the language functions associated with each. These language functions are written directly into the standards themselves. And in brief, we're moving from 15 discrete topics. Remember, these come out of the 1986 syllabus, Modern Languages for Communication. And we mostly taught them as discrete units of instruction, 15 units. Wow, how do I fit that all into an academic year? Now, more in the model of AP and IB, using four overarching themes with the 17 topics that are embedded within them, but not as 17 units of instruction. Instead, integrated with one another in the development 
of thematic units of instruction. And New York State has provided us with world language themes and topics. And again, you'll see that in this document, there is a page that has the themes and topics for modern languages and those for classical languages. And in brief, we're moving from New York State developed proficiency descriptors at three checkpoints to the actful proficiency descriptors with proficiency ranges at three checkpoints. I'd like to make a comment about this. Both of these were published in 1986. So what was happening is that New York State was developing proficiency guidelines based on the research that was out there simultaneously as ACTFL at a national level was doing the same. They weren't so far off, but now we're going to that national purview with the ACTFL proficiency descriptors and now with more nuance by using proficiency ranges rather than having one set of descriptors per checkpoint. And we also have dedicated different ranges to different categories of languages knowing and understanding the different skills develop at different rates and with different language categories. So you can see the actful proficiency pyramid, inverted pyramid in the center, the categories for category, or excuse me, the um, proficiency ranges for the category one, two languages at left, three, four languages at right. And on the next slide, we'll see them for the classical languages. And again, I remind you that there have been workshops on each one of these topics. So if you want and need to know more, not only you can refer to the guidance that's in the folder and on the State Ed website, but also to the webinars specific to these various topics. So at this point, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Bill. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm still talking. <laughs> My apologies. So our second level is the district level curriculum. And what you will see are images of two different documents that Bill will talk about. One of them is a course map. So as we're developing these units of instruction that come together to build the curriculum at a course level, we want to be documenting it at that course level in a map. We also want to be thinking about what are our goals for a given course. And then as we document those units, the document to the right is the unit plan template that we have developed. So Bill will get into these a little bit deeper later on. But I do want to introduce two mindsets for curriculum design. So here is the first one. Think about it this way. A curriculum is an inventory. It's an inventory of what is to be taught and how it will be taught and assessed for the realization of particular goals. A selection of content, of resources and activities that are organized and sequenced for consistency and continuity of instruction. And so some of those goals and some of those resources are going to be the ones that have been provided for you at the state level. Others will be ones that you're designing and developing at your district level. So another way to envision this curriculum as an organized and sequenced inventory is with the visual in front of you. Thinking about curriculum at the checkpoint level, and again, there would be one of these for each of your checkpoints, that you would have two or more courses. You might have more courses if you started in the elementary grades. And then for each one of the courses, a set of units. Now, I'm only showing four because that's what fits on the slide, but clearly you could have four, six, eight units of instruction per course in a given checkpoint. You want to make sure of those themes that each one is being addressed in each of the courses at least once, 
And you're starting to see redundancy because from one course to the next, it's not, oh, well, we've already taught that, but we revisit that. And the same is true, not only of the themes, but of the topics. And also the idea that the topics we want to integrate, an anchor topic that's associated with a theme, but then bringing in other topics to enrich it. Again, our goal is about that real world communication and real world doesn't separate topics because it was in a different theme. And a second mindset for curriculum design is one you're probably already quite familiar with, which is backward design. But I do want to remind you, especially those of you who had the opportunity to part participate in our unit planning sessions, that from the high leverage teaching practices, which are research based practices specific to our field, it's been identified that we don't just have three steps in backward design in the field of world language education, but rather we have five. And that first one is establishing the context. Everything we do is about making meaning, real world meaning. And so after we've established the context, we identify the desired outcomes. We determine the acceptable evidence and we plan those learning experiences. But we've also built in the opportunity for assessment and reflection of our planning with backward design. So one more point. Some of you have probably been thinking, but I have to use a textbook. I really want you to understand that the textbook is a point of departure. It is not a curriculum. While state ed doesn't give you a curriculum, it gives you standards and it gives you guiding documents from which to develop a curriculum. So you want to think about your textbook, not as a curriculum, but as a point of departure. So that inventory, start by inventorying as you're working on your curriculum design, your textbook chapter contents. From there, you want to select the contents that are going to contribute to purposeful and contextualized thematic units. You want to determine the anchor theme and integrated topics for each of your thematic units. So you're referencing the New York State themes and topics document as you're doing this. And these may or may not be identical to the ones that are presented in the textbook. And then you want to enhance the selected contexts with authentic resources and standards based learning tasks that support the unit themes that you've determined. Some textbooks will have resources that are closer to what the state is asking for with the standards, some it will be further away. Some of the authentic resources that have been embedded in the textbooks may be very usable. Some may be outdated because, of course, culture is dynamic. So have this in mind as you move forward into the next steps. And now I will turn it over to my colleagues, Bill and Lori. Thank you, Joanne. So how do we get started? The important first step is to identify some common ground for collaboration. Our temptation is to dive right in, create wonderful, engaging unit plans, because that's what we're good at, right? However, there are some preliminary steps to consider so that we can make our use of curriculum time and resources the most efficient. The first and most vital step is to enlist the support of our administrators. In your handout folder, you'll find one of our administrator reference guides, which explains the standards to administrators and enlists their support for awareness, time, and funding for professional development for all the teachers in the department. And it also enlists their cooperation in planning a robust standards implementation process that includes sufficient advocacy, time, 
and funding to complete properly. Once administrative support is solicited, a process and a timeline can be developed. Lori has an example of this that she can share with us. Lori? Thanks, Bill. Yes, absolutely. Time is so crucial in this process. And again, as Bill said, the support of administration. And so what you have here is an example from our FLESS program, our elementary language program. And when we started this program, we realized that we were really starting from scratch. We're starting um, anew, and we wanted to really pan out over the course of years as this program developed when we would be taking the time to design their uh, the curriculum that would go with each grade and so what you see here is a grid um, that we proposed and got support um, with lots of um, information for our administrators to help them understand the importance of this time we were able to secure some summer writing time um, again with that support from administration and we were lucky enough for a good many years to be able to spend the time over the summer, be four to five Spanish teachers working on a curriculum at a time, uh, a full year curriculum, of course, always connecting to the previous year's curriculum and building and articulating um, throughout. And so we were able to do this with a year's grace period. So you'll see we started in summer 2013 and we were able to design curriculum for the fall of 2014. And that enabled us to have a full year of, uh, of time to really re rework and bring in new materials and keep it fresh and keep it updated. You might notice that the entire summer of 2020 is grayed out. You, you likely know why. There was no summer curriculum work done that year. And so sadly, we are now uh, working on curriculum over the summer for the following fall. But at the very least, we have that lead time. We have that time given over to us. And again, this is really time that is approved and, and supported by our administration. But it's not always the summer that you're able to do this work. And some, some other times and spaces that we have made um, to do this uh, has been retreat days uh, when we're lucky enough to get a group of teachers, maybe not the entire department, but a small group of teachers to work on curriculum, designing new curricula, and also revising curriculum. Every year we look at what we've created and decide really what's working um, and what could be better. We often use department time for doing this, although that, as you know, is quite limited, but there is some um, great momentum that you can start by doing it within department time, um, language specific meetings. So often the French teachers will gather together, the Mandarin teachers will gather together to work on curriculum. And then, as you all know, as teachers, a lot of this is done ad hoc. So there's some incredible conversations happening um, in the office at any given time on the development of curriculum. Um, but having a plan in mind and getting that connection to your administrators when they see the value of the time together can be vitally important. Thanks, Lori. Uh, a second step prior to jumping into what that great leader, Miss Piggy, calls le nitty gritty of curriculum content is to engage in some facilitated conversations among the teachers of the entire department across all checkpoints. Possible conversation starters might include, what do we want to keep that we already do well? By the end of the program, what do we want all of our learners to know and be able to do? By the end of each checkpoint, what do we want all of our learners to know and be able to do? And finally, if someone walks into any of our classrooms, what should they expect to see and hear? How to um, develop and initiate those conversations, Lori has some guidance for. Absolutely. Those department conversations, as Bill mentioned, having them at the forefront at the start of this work can be so effective. And as he also said, efficient, because what, when you get everyone on the same page, those conversations later about designing curricula can really um, move faster when everyone is kind of speaking the same language. So some suggestions for these department conversations is, of course, that they be comfortable. 
we all think about our own students in our classes and feeling comfortable in the class and being able to take risks. Uh, we want that same environment for these meetings. And so finding a space that is pleasant, maybe that has some daylight or a window, um, getting off campus if that's possible is always really fruitful, but making sure that everyone's comfortable um, and, and can really put their best into these conversations. The conversations, of course, need to be inclusive of all voices. That means all stakeholders, all of the teachers involved in teaching this curriculum um, have a voice and have a say in, in how things progress. And so that might mean um, supporting those who are maybe less um, vocal to give them an opportunity to speak uh, and to really make sure that everyone's voice can be heard. It's also important to have adequate time. Time is always of the essence in our schools. And as we said earlier, time to design curriculum is scarce, time to meet together, but this is um, time really well spent. And so again, connecting with administrators and, and lobbying for that time and space to be able to gather and connect is so, is so crucial for this work. And then ultimately, a safe space, a space in which teachers can voice their opinions, talk about what they value, um, and what is important to them in the classroom and really be able to say those things and, and have fruitful conversations so that everyone is able to express their thoughts um, and, and come to some good conclusions so that the work can begin in earnest. After we have those important and perhaps long overdue conversations and get all the issues on the table, it's productive to somehow enshrine the content of those conversations in some kind of an actual actionable documentation. And that can take several forms that might include a statement of principles about proficiency driven language learning, a statement of agreement, we agree, or a mission vision statement, as many of our school districts already have. Lori has some uh, ideas about what these can look like. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, so those conversations that we had that were comfortable and felt safe and included all voices generated some thoughts about what we value in teaching languages, what we're doing really well, what we would like to see students be able to do at the end of a course or at the end of a sequence or a checkpoint or at the end of their schooling in your school. And so once we had that brainstorm, we all were able to share our beliefs about language learning and what how it can be most effective. We constructed this document that you see here, our essential agreements. And this is for teachers. This was designed by department members. Um, and essentially, we went through all of those thoughts, all of those beliefs, and we came to some pretty uh, wonderful conclusions that I think will resonate with many of you. Um, among them were comments about the use of target language, how we would scaffold the language for students, um, the encourage encouragement of taking risks, making sure that we have context uh, and real world authentic problems embedded in our curricula. We wanted to expose students to multiple disciplines and make those connections to other subject areas. We want to connect to the communities, not just uh, around the world, but also in and around New York City, where we are located. And of course, that safe environment where students can take risks. So these are the essential agreements that we designed as a result of those meetings. We revisit them frequently. Um, and revise them and make sure that they are still uh, connected to our beliefs. And of course, as we have new folks coming into the department as well, uh, that's an opportunity to get everybody's voices on the page. We then moved on to have a look at our school mission and really wanted to see what parts of our school mission resonated with some of the beliefs that we held about language learning and the essential agreements that we've already established. And you can see this is our school mission and several of the components resonated quite strongly with us, among them valuing all dimensions of each child, respect, compassion, and justice. The global community, of course, is very much in our purview. Risk taking, you heard me say several times earlier, is very important for us, and inquiry, and of course that interdisciplinary curriculum connection. So these are ways that we were able to make those connections to our school mission 
um, connected to what it is that we believed in. And then of course, this led to a mission statement for our own department. So again, this is something we look at and revisit frequently as a department. We have recently revised our mission statement to include our DEI and anti-racist mission. And so this is always a work in progress. Um, we also move from this to develop, to develop transfer goals for our students. And these are goals that we hope students will be able to accomplish long after they've left our program and our school. Um, what, and those goals really uh, explain and kind of highlight what it is that we hope that they'll be able to do in the language moving forward. So again, all of these steps help to build um, a, a common understanding, common beliefs, and moving from this point, you can dive into the curriculum um, work with a, a stronger collective understanding of what it is that we're hoping to accomplish. Thanks, Lori. Just like lesson and unit planning, the process for creating a course map like this one is recursive. As it develops, you often have to go back and make changes to other parts, but that's a good thing. It means that you're working toward that magical state of existence we call alignment. In the next section of this presentation, we'll look at all the elements needed to construct a course map that you see illustrated here. In good course planning, we need to juggle several interrelated concepts at the same time. The first starting place is the performance indicators for each course. You have that document in the folder. Find your checkpoint and course, and you will find a description for how each standard is demonstrated at the proficiency target for that identified course. For example, the highlighted box shows how standard three presentational communication is evidenced at the intermediate low proficiency target for checkpoint B year one, which we refer, traditionally refer to as level two. From there, we have to look at the language functions for each standard. We see here those 16 different language functions that Joanne talked about that are embedded into the five New York State World Language Standards. Each identified language function can be demonstrated in some way at every proficiency level. The form that that expression will take and the structures used will depend on the discourse type required at the proficiency target. The next step we talked about as in the advanced um, yeah, the uh, backward design. Once you've established your framework for thinking about a course, we can start making some important curricular decisions. And this is one of our major first decision points that we come to. Using the standards, performance indicators, and language functions as a frame of reference, just like you frame in a, a jigsaw puzzle when you do it, we can begin to consider contexts that will provide learners with meaningful reasons to communicate. Endless possibilities for creating appropriate contexts can be found among the four overarching themes and 17 topics that have been identified. In creating unit contexts, the interests of the learners can be tapped and then broadened through the use of a variety of authentic resources. These contexts will then suggest to us the vocabulary groups that we may wish to include on our curriculum map. We have the four themes, the 17 topics that are recycled through the three checkpoints. Another task to complete, another decision that needs to be made is to identify the desired outcomes for each standard by the end of the course. Course level can do statements, provide a basis for developing the unit level can do statements, and guide what the summative benchmark assessments will be based upon. These include the I can plus the language function plus the major context of the course. They always lead with a language function, provide communicative context. They're written in as much as possible learner-friendly language as opposed to teacher language. They're not task-specific, 
so that there are multiple ways and multiple contexts in which they can be uh, demonstrated. And then they can accommodate a range of proficiencies. These course level can do statements are general and should be echoed throughout a variety of contexts. Lori has one example she can share with us. And so here you see um, an example again from our FLESS curriculum. Uh, oops, sorry. There we go. Um, where we have um, the can do statements for our novice high students. And so we have interpretive, interpersonal, presentational. We also have intercultural can do statements. And so, as I mentioned, these were designed with uh, our colleagues together, our FLESS team, in connection with our middle school teachers as well, so that we really have that um, vertical alignment and vertical connection to the curriculum that um, they'll be connecting to, of course, in, in middle school. Um, and so you see the language functions here, understand, interpret, and analyze, um, lots of authentic materials here under interpretive. Um, they're looking at both uh, fictional texts and informational texts. For the interpersonal mode, of course, they're exchanging information and ideas and conversation, um, meeting needs and addressing situations, and expressing, reacting to, and supporting preferences and opinions in conversation. For the presentational mode, they'll present information um, and narrate about their lives and experiences. And again, this is all tied to their real world um, experiences as young learners of the language. For intercultural can-do statements, they're going to really be exploring both their own and other cultures. And of course, that leads to those cultural comparisons by identifying products and practices to help understand perspectives um, and also connecting to um, familiar everyday contexts. So this is work that was created um, together as a group, as I mentioned, um, to really start uh, this particular year of curriculum for our novice high learners. Thanks, Lori. As our course level can do statements come into focus, we can begin to think about the functional language chunks and grammatical structures we wish to utilize to enact the language functions. In this chart, we have juxtaposed the performance indicators from the chart you saw before and the language functions from each standard. So we can easily consider what, consider what functional chunks and what grammatical structures are necessary to carry out each of the language functions at that proficiency target. Now charts, these charts are for all three checkpoints are provided in the folder as well, along with all the other templates that we're sharing with you. Let's see what one of these looks like. So I've isolated just one piece of one of the years. So for checkpoint B year one, which is level two, I took out the um, chunk that was deals with standard three. So the performance indicator you see there, as it's written on the, the performance indicators, present information about my life and activities and make attempts to support preferences and opinions. That's the um, how it's written uh, using simple sentences through spoken, written, or sign language. So what's that going to? What are what are uh, the learners going to need uh, to? develop the different the five different uh, language functions at that target creating and using simple sentences through spoken written or sign language so for example we have if every time we're going to use the describing language function as part of our uh, unit can do statements we're going to work on the adjective noun agreement and we're going to work for partial control for example if we go to um, explanation Anytime we're doing the uh, language function of explaining, we're going to work toward partial control of the present tense and partial control of sequence words. Now, by identifying grammatical structures in our toolbox, we intentionally plan for redundancy of the key structures we need to be able to make continuous progress in the proficiency development of our learners. As their proficiency develops, the use of any particular form begins with a conceptual understanding. Using lots of scaffolding 
to establish a four meaning connection. Once that connection is established, then with additional practice in different contexts, eventually emerges partial control over the structure that involves less scaffolding. We can pull some of those scaffolds away. And finally, with abundant practice in a variety of contexts, learners gain automaticity and demonstrate full control of a structure. For this to happen, we need to first identify those structures that are absolutely necessary for the proficiency target, and then to plan for the intentional, repeated use of those structures. At the end of any course, learners may have full control of a few structures, partial control of others, and conceptual controls of others that will be developed further in subsequent courses. Once we have these basic elements of the course can do statements, the toolbox and the unit context selected, then it's time, dive in, plan and sequence those units. For this, you can use the unit plan template that we've thoroughly examined in a previous session. And that's also available in the folder for this session. Then once we have all those units planned, then a course map can be completed. Here's a template which puts the key information from all of the separate unit plans into one place. On this map, we can cut and paste right from the individual unit plans and put it right into this, this one map. So we take right from the unit plans, our meaningful unit title inquiry question and theme and anchor topic, our can do statements, our structures from the toolbox and vocabulary from the toolbox, and then our summative assessments for each of the three modes of communication, interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational. And again, you can add, if you do more than three units a semester, you can add and adjust those timeframes. This is just a sample. What would one, uh, here's what a piece would look like. So I've mapped in one of my units into the template. This templates for level two, checkpoint B year one. This was a unit we explored in the unit planning for checkpoint B on problem solving. Where do I go for good advice? And you see, I put the theme, the anchor topic and supporting topics, all the can do statements, copied and pasted them right from the unit plan. I've included our target structures, our target vocabulary, and then the three um, summative assessment tasks. You do that for all of the units and you have in one map, everything mapped out for your, um, for the entire course. Once you have that map completed, then you can use your course maps along with these two alignment audit charts that you'll also find in the handout folder. And it's in one, these two charts are in one document. In the first alignment chart, we look to see what topics are addressed, either as an anchor topic or as a supporting topic. We check the box each time the topic is included. This way we can see at a glance if our course, along with the other course in the checkpoint, has sufficient breadth and that the key topics are approached multiple times through the course and through the checkpoint. So the first audit chart is the topic integration chart. The second is the language functions chart and the, to see how the language functions are developed. Once again, we'll use the information in that course map now that we've got everything on one page, specifically looking at the language functions that are identified in the can do statements. We check off the targeted language functions used in each group and then any gaps within a single course or between the two courses in the checkpoint will indicate a gap that needs to be addressed by going back that recursive process, going back and making necessary adjustments to the can-do statements and learning, uh, learning tasks in the unit plans themselves. You may have to add a few things. Maybe you've overemphasized one thing, you can make some room for some of the things that were left out. By this gap analysis, then you can see where um, 
the gap where the gaps are, fill in those gaps before implementing the curriculum to make sure that you have sufficient breadth and sufficient interleaving of the both the language functions and the topics to provide for the maximum opportunity for the development of proficiency. Then once the audits are done for each course and each checkpoint, then it's easy to do vertical alignment for the entire curriculum as suggested by this diagram. Recalling the inverted pyramid model of proficiency, as learners move from checkpoint to checkpoint, it's necessary to recycle communicative tools and to continuously expand the breadth, breadth of the content so that learners can continue to grow in their proficiency. So as the pyramid expands, as it moves up, you expand the breadth of the of the topics and themes that they can communicate about. Joanne? So that final portion is, again, the one you're most familiar with, the daily lesson plans. So what you see here on the screen is um, a, a screenshot of the lesson planning template. And that was our most recent webinar um, at the end of March. And so, again, another tool that you'll find in in the folder and so we're not going to add too much to this other than here is our organized sequence inventory that's looking at the checkpoint it's looking at the courses it's looking at the units and the topics that are embedded in those units and one more level of this are the sequence of lesson plans that you'll be designing that you'll be delivering, that you'll be assessing, that will scaffold students through each one of the units with the language functions, in the context, with the language structures and the vocabulary that supports them. And of course, building in the redundancy, building in the proficiency development. So with this, we're coming back to our goals to revisit them. I can identify the three levels of curriculum development. I can identify what guides development of a world language curriculum. I can identify strategies for developing consensus around curricular goals. I can identify steps for developing a world language curriculum. And I can identify steps for examining a world language curriculum for its horizontal and vertical alignment. And at this point, we invite you to enter questions you may have into the chat. So we'll give people a moment. And one of the questions was, will we be getting the link to the folder? And Bill has just put that back into the chat. And again, Candy will send it to you when she sends you that follow-up email. So I'm going to ask Lori, who's monitoring the chat, to let me know what questions may be being asked. Yes, thanks, Joanne. We have a great question about, um, we, we've of course talked about vertical alignment, but the question is, what are your suggestions for aligning this design horizontally with other languages in your department? For example, aligning horizontally French and Spanish. So, I mean, I, the first thing is, I'm not sure that actually has to happen completely. So the themes and topics, in other words, the context that are chosen for one language may or may not be the same ones for another language. If those languages are in the same language category, they should be following the same um, proficiency descriptors and performance indicators for that same curriculum. Um, and then of course, what structures tend to be more appropriate at a given level of proficiency will vary from language to language. So there would be some variation. I'm watching Bill and Lori's heads nod, but I invite them to jump in and add to that response. I'd be happy to jump in. Um, I, I've heard this a lot from, from different schools asking about, you know, wouldn't it be great if, if there were some alignment? And I think there are certain things that can be aligned and there's probably some, some good benefit into having folks work on curricula together. 
maybe in the same room so they can build off each other's work. Um, but as, as Joanne said, I, I don't think that it needs to be aligned in that way um, as long as there are um, the proficiency levels are are appropriate, um, but the content and the culture is going to be different. And so I don't think we need to be slavish to having that kind of um, that sort of uh, horizontal alignment, unless it suits your particular context. And unless there's something that's kind of simpatico, right? So maybe you have some French teachers and some Spanish teachers who are really excited about something that is similar in nature and you can, you have that going on. But I, I don't think it has to be um, done in that way. Bill? Yeah, I agree. I think you, you could come to a point of agreement on course level can do statements um at that point about what you want them to do but even then there may be departure depending on how how the structures of the language work and as as Lori and joanna have mentioned the culture which really drives your context is going to be um different enough that you don't want any uh to, you don't want to force what doesn't what might hold you back um that's what i agree yeah. i have uh, another question that's coming i'm sorry bill did you want to say something nope nope i'm just looking at the box again. okay um a question about student voice that is being asked and answered throughout um these these wonderful comments so question about in designing the curriculum how can we incorporate student voice and then somebody else commented that wouldn't student voice come from the input that they give during the lesson and activities so some some question about how student voice um comes in through the curriculum. So I have some different thoughts. I mean, one is, as you've come to know your students over time, developmentally, personally, um, community wise, that would be very much part of the teacher's thought process in what they bring to that group conversation. Um, that said, I know people who have turned to students and explicitly asked them to you know, make evident what they're interested in. And curricula has been designed with that in mind. And of course, you could always invite a student or two um, or more, I guess, into the curriculum planning process. Um, the more mature students are going to be able to have a more informed voice. I will add that when our standards were designed, we did open it up to students and we did have a student participant in the design of our New York State World Language Standards. So there's always a place for it. Um, I think that there's a variety of ways that that can happen. I see quite a few questions coming in about examples of curriculum. Um, one of the things I really want you to make sure that you took note of is that at the state level, the curriculum responsibility is to provide teachers and districts the resources. Curriculum is a local decision. So we will not be giving sample curricula. That's not what we do. Um, we're giving you the resources to be able to do that. That said, there's a lot of attention to bringing teachers together. I saw some questions around the summer work that we're doing um, where teachers can come and gather together to make to build relationships, especially if you are in a singleton type of situation to come up with collaborative partners. I know even in the Adirondacks, there's a PLC uh, professional learning. What's the C stand for? Community. Community. I was going to say yeah. collaboration. Um, that is composed of singleton teachers oh, from a a could you please I'm mute into... yourself Ali, Ali. thank you um that's composed of singleton teachers from around the area who've all come together so please join into um the work that we're doing bringing together or even through a professional organization like nice felt you know what are the other um who are the other teachers in my area that I might be able to connect to. As Joanne mentioned at the beginning too, there's a we have a needs assessment coming up that you're going to get um, uh, in your email. Look for, look for your email, fill out that uh, needs assessment and make sure to voice those concerns. As having been a single teacher in 
a um, rural school district having responsibility for checkpoint B and C. Uh, I really uh, hear men, those of you who are uh, feeling a little overwhelmed by having to do a lot of this process and our French teachers who have all three checkpoints, all six courses. Um, take it one course at a time. Do that course map one, one course at a time with kind of an eye on what you'll do the next year uh, in the second year. And the nice thing, we still have this implementation plan time. So you, we don't have to do it all at once. It can be an evolving process that we engage in. And then as uh, Joanne just mentioned, take advantage of those opportunities regionally that we facilitate at the state that your BOCES district might facilitate. You can nudge them a little bit your, through your SCDN person to facilitate that type of, uh, those type of gatherings so that you um, have opportunities to sit down with other teachers and go through and work on some of this, these alignment issues. I, I must say alignment's a lot easier when you're a, a, a one pony show. Um, <laughs> Cause I, I knew, well, if I didn't get to a level two, I get to a level three. You know, I could do it that way. So it's a, a, a an interesting, uh, it, there are pros and cons to being in that position. But um, we have, the, the good the good news is we have time and then we can create structures for support and you can ma make a pitch for us to do that by filling in that needs assessment that, that that be a priority for us to create those times when teachers can come together who are the only persons teaching those courses and to to do some collaborating and sharing. I'll also encourage you, if you haven't already, to join our Facebook group. Um, I, I love the idea of crowdsourcing and asking questions of others, what you're struggling to find, somebody else may have already found, um, and then some. So I'm going to pop that link into the um, into the chat. Please feel free to join. Please ask the membership questions when you do sign up. That's good information for us. Um, but that's a wonderful resource for you to um, ask questions of each other and to really find that support. Thank you, Lori. I want to point out that it's five o'clock. It's actually 501. And so for those of you who signed up for the one hour, you are all set and you're welcome to log off. But we have many, many questions still in the chat, and we're more than happy to continue to answer those. So if you want to stay on and keep listening to answers or chatting with us, you're welcome to do that. Um, Lori, what other questions are you seeing in the chat? Yeah, so um, seeing again some challenges about authentic resources um, and how to find them and incorporate those into um, into curriculum. So Bill, would you just click on that very next slide? A reminder that we have um, a New York State World Language Standards Initiative Authentic Resources Wakelet. The Wakelet is a curation site kind of like a museum of links um, for many different languages. And uh, Barbara Patterson has been curating this and adding on a regular basis. So please find the time this summer to go through, click around. Um, a lot of, there had been a lot of requests for more auditory um, authentic resources, and those have been um, a, a current focus of her work, as well as adding additional languages. Finally, it's not about the quantity of authentic resources. You may find a few per unit, and then you want to just maximize their use. Those authentic resources sessions will be very, very useful for your work, as all of the sessions that we've done that have talked about authentic resources. Please feel free as you use these templates to give us feedback on how they work. Um, they, are, they are works in progress and uh, as well. But uh, if you work with the templates that are in the folder and um, find some, uh, you know, have questions about them, please feel free to ask about them or, or direct them to us. Um, there was a, a question about the, um, you know, uh, the, the eventual checkpoint assessments. The, my response to folks when they ask is that if you teach a curriculum that's aligned to the standards, that has sufficient breadth of topics, your, your students will be fine on whatever assessment because whatever assessment the state comes up with, um, 
that will have to be aligned to this curriculum. Uh, the, the standards, it'll be aligned to the standards, those language functions, and those themes and topics. So if you teach the themes and topics, and, and the kids can do the different um, language functions at the uh, identified target of proficiency, they'll be fine. Um, it, and it'll be a proficiency-based um, testing model, and I, you know, you could feel confident about that. Anything else anyone is seeing that we haven't responded to yet? I'm going to reshare the Facebook link, but um, I don't think so. So I'm going to have Candy respond to any of the questions about assessment because that's not under our purview. Candy, would you like to unmute yourself and respond to this, these questions about assessments? Sure. I see a couple of them in there, um, such as from Katie, is the state going to begin providing checkpoint assessments again? So it's always been our very vocal intention to do what we can to bring back state developed assessments. Uh, but as we've communicated uh, this goal, we've also tempered it with um, it is not uh, our decision solely to do this. So there's a whole process that's involved where we put it to a vote for the Board of Regents, and then that goes to the governor and it needs to be included in the governor's budget in order for it to be approved. Uh, so the other thing we are communicating is part of that process is that we will be attempting to bring this state developed exam back starting for checkpoint A in June of 2025. And if you take a look at the standards implementation timeline, you'll see that that will be the first time when the seventh graders who are going to begin with the revised standards in September of 2023 will reach the end of checkpoint A. Um, so that would be the earliest. And that is, again, if we are successful in getting those budgets approved. So we noticed that some of you, thank you, Candy. We noticed that some of you have asked about um, the unit plan exemplars that would, were developed through the spring. We just had to put that on pause. Um, two of us are college professors and the end of the semester was near and we had to kind of survive that. Um, so we thank you for your patience. We will be getting back to those. We just had to put a little pause on it. Thank you. Um, other questions? I'm seeing lots and lots of things popping up before my eyes. One if was about if you're if you don't have a department chair, what what can you do? And then this is something that, um, you know, I, as again in a small school, I ran into the you have to kind of advocate with your administrator. And that's why the administrative guides that are on the um, website, stated website are gonna be so important. Make sure that your administrators have these guides. Um, eventually we'll be getting to, or in, very soon we'll be getting to doing outreach to administrators directly to make sure that these are disseminated well and uh, within the different BOCES districts. So the administrators will Will get have us in their ear as well, telling them that they should be supporting you. So, um, you but we you can do it from from your end as well. Make sure they they have these administrator guides. Um, make some time to sit down with them to do some of that planning process that we talked about uh, early in this session. And I'll add to that, Bill. I, I think um, the best advocacy is constant and light over a long period of time. So it never ends. One of the best bits of advice I got when I just started teaching was, we're not just teachers and curriculum designers, but we need to advocate. As language teachers, we always advocate for our programs. And so advocacy can be just sharing a link to a wonderful article from the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. It could be sharing, of course, these very important administrator guides, but 
it happens over time and especially for those districts where folks are feeling you know you're the only game in town um, as bill mentioned it's important for you to just be constantly sharing just little tidbits here and there and that's with your administrators also with your colleagues it's kind of um, helping folks to understand what we're doing in the language classroom and also how it benefits the school as a whole so i see it as a very long process it's a it's a marathon not a sprint so I just noticed a question. Uh, do we have a list of grammar points that should be taught per level? And grammar is not what we're assessing. Rather, our students' ability to carry out language functions. And the grammar supports that. But the goal is that the students can carry out the language function within the real world context. So no, there's no particular grammar. Um, Bill, do you want to add to that? Uh, no, that's the uh, you the the grammar emerges from the language functions that is consistent with the production necessary or dictated by the um, performance indicator. So if they're, you know, at those producing at the say the sentence level of discourse, um, what's going to enable them to what structures do they need to, to do that function? Um, you know, say it's um, express an opinion it can be very, um, they can be done with language chunks in checkpoint A. You can use some structures and other more sophisticated language chunks at checkpoint B. Then they're gonna use um, other structures at checkpoint C. So that, that same function is gonna evolve through the checkpoints, but there's no um, specificity because as Joanne said, we're not gonna test them on their grammatical knowledge, but their ability to carry out the language function for which they'll need those structures. Um, that you can, you know, build in. And if you keep repeating the functions, you're going to be keeping repeating the structures that they need. So I see Mustafa's hand, but there were a couple questions right before that that I'll take first. Um, somebody was asking, do we need to take a quiz after the presentation? The quiz is only for the people who aren't present um, for the live presentation, but rather are watching the viewing. So if you were here logged on, for the whole session, you're all set, no quiz needing to be taken. And Irlanda asked, will BOCES be offering workshops um, for teachers in your district, all teaching different grades? Um, Candy, have you, do you have any response specifically to this in regard to BOCES? Yes, some of BOCES have uh, developed plans for workshops, building upon the work that you've seen. I would absolutely say to you that you're first and foremost, you should be looking at the workshops that have been produced by NYSED. That is a primary set of source documents. Um, but in addition to that, you may want to be able to also attend those. Now, they're not mandated, so you'll have to check with your VOCES to see if they're going to offer them through whatever My Learning Plan system you use. Um, and if they aren't, you can always have your director of professional learning, um, or if you have a direct contact at that VOCES, you could reach out to them and tell them that you're interested in such a workshop. So Mustafa, you had your hand raised and I lost you. Are you still there with a question? Go ahead. I am, I am indeed. I don't know if you can, can you hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. I can. Wonderful, because I've had quite a bit of, of trouble uh, listening to some static things, but that's also because of where I am. Um, the, the point I wanted to make, and, and, and I think it sounds like a broken record, I've said this before. For the person who asked about the grammar points, is there any grammar that that needs to be taught. Same question, I think, has been paralinked to um, how many vocabulary items should 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 a teacher present um, per, per, per session or um, unit or and 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 I, and I feel that the pressure is coming mostly, really mostly, um, not solely but mostly from textbooks that are still in their structural approach. When you look at the chapter when you look at the index, there are grammar based. And if there is an administrator, and I have nothing against administrators who don't speak the languages, who are not into language language learning, they're really um, um, evaluating their teachers based on, well, where are you at now? Can they say something in the past? Can they say something in the present? So th there, there's some sort of a, a disconnect, I think, between publishers and act followers. I'm not sure if, if, if this is a kind, a kind comment, 
But as long as that 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 that, that um, separation exists, then the, the the teacher. No, I'm not talking about novice teachers. I've heard this and I've observed this in many classrooms. Are still saying, um, no, I'm doing chapter two, and um, no, we're not talking about the past. It's almost as if we have to wait until the end of the year before they can. Um, the students are able to say something about what they did on 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 the weekend. So I I I don't know if there's a um, a kind reminder to publishers to start looking into what ACTFL or any any um, language association, I believe, are doing in order to also move in a parallel way and stop focusing on a structural lexical approaches when publishing their books. When uh, publishers publish what will make money and will sell, when this stuff stops selling, it will change. And so um, when districts stop buying textbook series as curriculum because it's cheaper to then paying teachers to create good curriculum, then um, those textbooks will change. I believe some of them are because I think the textbook sales are, are starting to plummet. People don't look for them as much. So I think you'll start to see that evolution, but you're right. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it is a point of disconnect that we deal with, but um, I think this is the way to do it. I, th I, th I think we are going to be the tail that wags the dog of the textbook companies by by just voting with our dollars and voting with our feet, you know, uh, on what we buy and what we don't buy. Um, so that that would be my response to, to that, what you said. That, that would be so, wonderful. And I'm just sorry. Okay. I no, just I wanted to say, Laurie was talking about advocating for. For, for, for language and for language learning. But I think we also need to encourage teachers to advocate for, I don't know, developing their own curriculum, something that is tailored towards their own classrooms, to the levels and how they want to move forward. And and then some convincing. Uh, I know that there are sessions on, on, uh, on the website for the OBAW for, for administrators to really see what language teachers are, are doing. And, and I think something ought to be put in there to encourage, um, I don't know, some sort of, uh, um, not independence, not total independence, but at least allowing teachers to also pull stuff from their own curriculum. I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm taking too much time. Um, but it's a wonderful no, session. I we, we appreciate your passion. Um, the okay. administrator work is just beginning. We do have two documents, one that we shared today. We have another one that really tries to articulate specifically to administrators what they should be seeing and how it's different from what they may be anticipating. And the third version will be more of the very precise what this looks like with alignment to the various um, evaluation rubrics. And then it's our intention to offer sessions for administrators. Um, again, we are attempting to do a lot of work and we want to do it to the highest quality we can. It's happening. Um, and then, of course, for teachers who aren't yet comfortable, knowledgeable about the shifts, watching those webinars on grammar and vocabulary that we've done, I think will be very, very informative to them. So we're working towards those same ends. So thank you for that. In answer to a question, the PDF has been moved into the folder, so it's already there for you. Okay, Lori, catching any other questions that we've missed? Uh, let's see. Um, so Tiffany is saying she's completed every session and loves them. Thank you, Tiffany. Uh, and she knows that teachers who are doing these sessions because they're, uh, uh, that some teachers are not doing the sessions because they're optional. So um, what are our thoughts on this? Well, the sessions may be optional, but implementing the standards won't be optional. This will be an expectation from the state education department. I mean, the gift is everything has been uh, archived and it may be that people just weren't ready. Heaven knows we're working under very, in very stressful times right now. And so this summer might be a better time 
over time, especially if someone's teaching at checkpoint B or C and they see that they're not, their, their curriculum isn't impacted immediately. But ideally, um, having the checkpoint B and C teachers work with the checkpoint A teachers, everybody will be on the same page. We, we can't make people do things, but we can certainly invite them. So let's be invitational. Yeah, and I can add to that, along with the advocacy for time in curriculum development, is time to visit others' classrooms. We are so isolated and work in such a siloed fashion that it's oftentimes we just head off into our classroom, come back to a central room maybe where we work, and nobody gets to see what's going on. And so I think rather than, you know, having that concern or making it feel like, you know, others aren't kind of up to speed, being able to invite folks into your classroom, knowing what your colleagues might really love to see in action. And I find it really helpful to kind of entice folks and, and, and to show them something that's working really well, to show students doing something really incredible in the language, sharing student work and saying, hey, check this out. My student just did this. Can you imagine? This is how this task led to this output of language. And so that sort of collaboration, again, it's kind of a long term over time, just inviting folks in, sharing materials is one way to, to get folks to, to join us on this journey. All right, I think we've answered everything. I think you have. You guys have done a great job. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here. We appreciate you. Hope to see some of you at our summer sessions around the state.